Fertility Factor Fiction. I am your host, Dr. Rahi Victory. I am a Canadian and American board certified reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialist, willing to answer pretty much any question you can ask me about anything in obstetrics and gynecology and mostly in infertility. Uh, this is our weekly show where sometimes we have information to present and sometimes we do not have a study to present. There was really nothing super cool to share with you guys this week. So I figured I would just go straight to your questions. Uh, I am just back from holidays as well. So I do have the good excuse of the fact that um, I wasn't as prepared as I probably should be. So I am here with my trusty friend, Tarek from Ibrahim Strategies Group, a great guy and wonderful at social media stuff. So if you need someone for social media, find Tarek and he will help you out. And uh, we are very happy to have you all join us. We are gonna go straight to questions tonight. I will tell you that um, there is some interesting stuff that is coming around the corner. We reviewed last week uh, how letrozole cycles were better than uh, either natural or program cycles. And there is a new article just published in uh, Human Reproduction where they basically said that program cycles where you're taking estrogen and then taking progesterone are essentially dead, that those should not be used anymore because they are not as good. Um, and that we need to start looking at new alternatives to the program cycles. Here at VRC, we have not been doing those for about three years. Um, so we're in uh, quite good shape because we are way ahead of the curve here. So I'm very pleased about that. And it's nice to see that others are finally coming around. Um, and it's been interesting because I've been working with people who want to do a uh, VRC type protocol in their centers and get a lot of pushback from their doctors or, or their centers and they just can't, including some in Ontario where um, their doctors just won't listen and, or won't provide them with the care they're looking for. So uh, we're always happy to provide you with care um, or advice if we can help you in any way, don't hesitate and uh, we will do our best for you. Um, so yeah, we are open to taking questions tonight. I was scanning the literature looking for uh, anything kind of interesting aside from that um, one article, there is some uh, other information slowly trickling out about how long it's okay to keep your frozen embryos frozen for. There does appear to be a possible optimal time um, within which you are going to get your highest chance of success or so exploring that a little bit more. Um, some of you may have uh, been victims of the shortage of antagonists. If you're running an IVF cycle or an IUI cycle right now, as many of you know, there was a huge shortage of getting orgolutran and or cetratide uh, because of low supply and back orders. So um, that started making us look at progesterone prime cycles, um, which is another thing that's up and coming because you can actually use progesterone instead of an antagonist. And some people say you get at least the same, while other people say even better results doing that, and it is a hell of a lot cheaper. So that's something we're gonna explore as well in a future episode. Um, if you're following us on YouTube, just wanna say thank you for all of those of you who keep jumping onto our YouTube channel. It's been growing leaps and bounds in the last uh, few months. Um, with thousands and thousands of views every day. So we are very appreciative. And just a shout out to all of you who have been supporting us on YouTube uh, and our other social media platforms. Thank you for that. And um, that's uh, pretty much everything. So do we have questions already? We always have questions already, yeah. So we're gonna start answering your questions tonight. Um, if you ask a question and I haven't answered it, I will get to it. Just, so just hang around because some people ask the question and then leave. But I always try and get to your questions and we just go one by one. So um, we will get there. Just hang in there and, and continue watching and we will answer your question. Um, and you can always watch them back afterwards. They do go up on YouTube. They stay on Instagram. And are they on Facebook too afterwards for 24 Facebook. hours? Yeah. 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 On Facebook. Permanently, the whole time. Oh, yeah. so you're on Facebook too. There you go. I'm never on our Facebook channel, so there you go. All right, fire away. So these are questions <clears throat> I asked earlier on Instagram. Oh, okay, great. Uh, ICSI or standard IVF for fertilization for uh, someone who has DOR? So um, ICSI is an interesting thing. If you look at the studies on ICSI, they all support the fact that ICSI is not useful unless you're dealing with a situation where there is severe male factor and it's needed because the sperm itself 
is not good enough to penetrate the egg or cause fertilization to occur. The problem with all of those studies is that the centers that are providing that um, therapy or, or that data are getting 70%, 75% ICSI success rate. So I recently spoke with an embryologist online um, and I said, what kind of success rates are you getting? And that individual said, oh, my ICSI success rate's about 70% and um, said that that was kind of comparable with the average. So we're not getting 70%, we're getting over 90% success with our ICSI. So when you have that kind of level of success, it's hard to justify not using ICSI. When you're in a situation where you have diminished ovarian reserve, it's even more important because you only have a limited number of eggs and you wanna make sure that each of those eggs fertilizes and becomes an embryo. So as a result of that, it's really quite critical that you do get a very high level of fertilization. If your center is getting the same rates with fertilization naturally that they get with ICSI, there's probably no benefit for you. But if you can go to a center that's going to get you a 90, 95% success rate, you kind of be crazy not to do ICSI because it, it doesn't make sense not to do it in that circumstance. And again, all the guidelines say it's only indicated for severe male factor, but those guidelines are based on studies where they're getting a 70% ICSI rate. That does not make sense. So, you know, if you are going somewhere where they are very proficient and they have a very high level of success, yeah, of course you should be doing ICSI. That, that only makes sense to maximize your chances of success per egg. Great question. I got a comment here that I couldn't <clears throat> stop myself from. Reading? From reading. Okay. Dr. Bean T, you too are our highlights on Tuesday. Oh, that's very nice. So then they snuck their question in. <laughs> but I'll, we'll read it anyway. All right. Uh, we did the receptiva DX test results. Sure. Uh, there's a possibility of a luteal phase defect. What does this mean? Okay, so first of all, receptiva DX has been proven not to work. It was a study just a month and a half, two months ago. So don't follow anything that Receptiva DX tells you because it's not of any value. The BCL6 protein that they're looking for, not useful in determining if you have um, actually a uh, history of endometriosis or not, which is the main thing it looks for. And it tells you if you're receptive or not to some extent. Um, luteal phase defect is interesting. The theory with luteal phase defect was that the lining of your uterus is not ready, mostly because of a problem with progesterone, and therefore it wouldn't allow an embryo to implant. Um, back when I was in fellowship, um, which was a very long time ago, we won't go into that detail right now, um, they demonstrated that luteal phase defect actually doesn't exist. It, it's non-existent. There is no such thing as luteal phase defect. So um, we don't really pay any attention to that anymore. Um, and I would very strongly shy away from anyone that's talking to you about luteal phase defect because it's not a thing. Now, is your progesterone level important? Are your estrogen levels important? Does your lining have to be optimized in order for you to succeed? Yes, 100%. Are those things that we can measure very easily without having to spend a fortune on Receptiva DX? Yes, absolutely. But those are not related to a luteal phase defect. Those are just related to having adequate support from progesterone. Um, and that's something easily you can find out from a, a blood test. Yeah, so ignore your receptivity DX. Don't follow that. It's not going to be helpful for you. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. I hate the fact that people have spent good money on something that's not valuable. <clears throat> Is a subchronic hemorrhage concern? What happens if it doesn't go away? So a subchorionic hemorrhage is when there is blood between the placental um, site or between the sac and the uterus. And it can come out because there is a gap between the sac and the cervix. And so it can actually trickle, trickle out and oftentimes you'll see some bleeding. Um, if it's quite large, it can cause miscarriage. If it's not that large, it almost always goes away. It's very, very rare that a subchorionic hemorrhage will remain throughout a pregnancy. Um, you almost never see that. It's very, very rare. Uh, is a subchorionic hemorrhage associated with increased risk in the pregnancy? Yes, there are patients that have more bleeding, 
preterm labor, premature rupture of membranes. Um, all of these are possibilities. So your risks do go up when you have a subchorionic hemorrhage, but it's only the risks that go up. It doesn't mean, oh my God, I'm going to have a preterm baby. It means your chances of having a preterm baby are a little bit higher, but not enough to make anybody panic or, or you know, get um, devastated by this. It's unusual for us to see that a pregnancy that is troubled by subchorionic hemorrhage actually runs into genuine trouble later on. So um, we definitely don't recommend doing anything to make it worse. So avoid anticoagulants, aspirin, heparin, things like that. Um, nothing traumatic, no heavy lifting, no straining. We generally tell our patients not to have intercourse if they have a substantial subchorionic hemorrhage, not because we know if it makes a difference or not, but because it will always make people feel guilty if they do have sex and then they have a miscarriage and they're going to say, oh my God, it was the sex. It wasn't, but we don't want you to panic about that. So we tell you to, to kind of take it easy. So low key exercise or none, no heavy lifting, no straining, um, you know, try and keep the sex gentle if you are having sex or none at all. Um, and then just give it time. We'll often put our patients on progesterone and usually it just seals back down and it goes away. Um, my dog is prepping for a transfer cycle. Cycle day three, two milligrams, two milligrams twice daily for two days. Cycle day six, two milligrams three times daily. Cycle day nine, yeah. uh, four milligrams twice daily uh, until day seven. Is this an absolute no uh, based on the left result study in your protocols? So that's like a conventional, you know, um, hormone replacement or what we call a programmed cycle. And, and every study out there now has supported the fact that um, the letrozole cycle is better than a program cycle. Um, there's a lot of back and forth as to whether a natural cycle is better than a program cycle. And there are studies that say yes, and there are studies that say they're the same. There are no studies that show that the program cycle is better or very few. Um, that show that the program cycle is better than a natural cycle, but letrozole is better than both. Um, and there are lots of studies that are showing that. So is it an absolute no? Well, no, because we've been doing it for 40 years, right? So um, 50 years now. So it's not an absolute no. You can go ahead and try it and you may have success because people have been having success for a very long time using that protocol. Um, does it make sense in today's world where... We have better options for you. And there are studies that demonstrate you can get an even higher success with other options. Not in my mind, um, but I wouldn't hit the brakes in the middle of a cycle to kind of um, try and change things right away. That's something where you need to make sure that your fertility program is engaged with you. They're willing to try something different. They have the knowledge to do it. Um, they have the ability to do it. So for example, there is a facility in Ontario who will not provide patients with the monitoring they need to do a letrozole cycle because they say they're just too busy. I'm not quite sure how you get away with that, but nevertheless, that does exist out there. And I was speaking to a patient um, in the city that that uh, fertility program is in, and she's really struggling because she wants to use our protocol, but they literally can't provide the assistance she needs in order to do that because our protocol does require more monitoring. So you, you need to have engagement, you, you need to have cooperation, you need to have partners that will, and I mean fertility partners, that will actually provide you with the care that is needed in order to get the right kind of protocol for you. If they can't do it, then you have to kind of follow their instructions. Otherwise, you're going to kind of mess up everything and you won't know what's going on. Hi. If I had a laparoscopy in 2013 <clears throat> for endometri endometri mm -hmm. endometriosis, endometriosis yeah. should I have another one? Um, well, there's not enough information in that question because I don't know if you're having pain, if you're having infertility, um, what the situation is. But uh, we know that the effects of surgical treatment of endometriosis only last six months to a year from a fertility perspective. Pain and recurrence are different, but from a fertility perspective, your maximum time to pregnancy is within six months to a year after surgery. So if you're now 10 years, nine years later, you're thinking of doing it uh, like getting pregnant now, um, it's definitely something that needs to be considered. 
I'm not going to tell you you should run off and do surgery again because there's always risks, but it's definitely going to be on the list of options for sure. And after V, IT. Both of us. There you go. Tarek loves it when you include him, guys. So always the high Dr. V and T or T and B. That's good too. Oh, high Dr. T. Sometimes that's good. Yeah, once in a while we get the high Dr. T. Yeah. Uh, have you done a show on calcium ionosphere? Ionosphere. Ionophore. Um, so I think we did do one on oocyte activation. Um, we are now using it for patients that have had previous failures automatically on all those patients or patients with really bad sperm. Um, so we have adopted using um, calcium ionophore activation. The data is pretty clear that it is beneficial. I think we did do a, a video on that a few months ago, actually. So yeah, I think we have reviewed it um, and it does work well. So we're, we're doing that in our practice. Hola, Dr. V and T. Hola, hey. Como how, many, como how many days after IUI do you recommend to start progesterone? My doctor told me to start four days after the IUI, 200 milligrams suppositories. Gracias for all you do. Um, thank you. Uh, no, you, you should be starting it the day after you do your IUI. If you think about the biology of it, that's when it makes sense. Four days later is a bit late. So um, just start it the day after you do your IUI. Hi, Dr. V. <laughs> Don't know if I should read it. Uh, can you please discuss nupagen? Is it beneficial in donor egg FETs? Thank you. Um, so nupagen has multiple uh, avenues of treatment. It can be used to thicken your lining. It can be used to treat your embryos and culture. It can be used to treat immunologically disturbed endometrium. So it depends on why you need it. Um, with donor eggs, the only reason would be if there's a problem with your endometrium, um, whether you need to thicken it or whether you need to treat immunological issues. Um, you definitely wouldn't be putting it in the blastocyst culture for the embryos because they should be quite strong if you're using donor eggs. So um, it can be used both as an infusion into the uterus for lining thickening, which does work well, actually or it can be used as a routine injection for the control of immunological infertility or um, immunologically mediated infertility. And so it uh, works quite well for both of those. So yes, those are both available options and we do talk to our patients about those options when they've had a failure. Would I do it automatically in a donor egg cycle? No, but I would if you had failed one or two embryos and you still had some left. Um, I wouldn't do it otherwise. Do I need to wait until three failed IUIs to get on the Ontario funded IVF list? Um, in our practice, we decided that there are certain criteria where we put people straight on, and there are certain criteria where we definitely strongly encourage you to do your three funded IUI first, because many of those patients will succeed and that keeps them from waiting a year or two or whatever it is to get on the funded list. So. Um, just talk to us, to me or to your nurse, and they'll go through the details with you. Um, there's no law that says you have to wait for three IUI. Every program is allowed to do their own determination. And we just decided that unless you had severe male factor, severe endo, age over 39, or blocked tubes, we would ask you to do um, the three IUI first. Hi, Dr. BNT. I have five days post transfer and at home pregnancy tests are positive. Does this mean it works? Uh, um, okay, first of all, nobody should be testing five days after an embryo transfer. Please, I'm begging all of you. I know it's super difficult, but you're just going to get misleading results doing that. So please, 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 please don't test five days after an embryo transfer. Um, it could mean it, it's positive. There's no way to know that early on. So um, it's certainly hopeful, um, but it would also depend on whether they had done an HCG wash. If they did, you could still be picking up lingering HCG from the HCG wash. So don't jump into it that quickly. You need to wait a minimum of 10 to 12 days post-transfer before you start testing. The anxiety you're gonna generate for yourself now 
having tested after day five and then wondering what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day, that's actually enough to cause it to fail. So please, please, please do not test five days after. I know the two-week wait is hard. There are loads of people that talk about things to do during the two-week wait. The reality is there is no answer for what's right. The best thing to do is do things that you enjoy. If you like cooking, go cook. If you like sex, have sex. If you want to walk by the beach, go have a walk by the beach. If you need a slice of apple pie, go have a slice of apple pie. Whatever works for you, as long as it's not bad for you, smoking, drinking, drug use, go do whatever you want to do and just relax and wait until that 10 days, 12 days, 14 days goes by. Is estrogen and progesterone priming for 30 days prior to retrieval effective? Um, no. So estrogen priming is not effective. And there was a study recently, randomized controlled trial, which demonstrated that estrogen priming does not work. Um, we just reviewed that two weeks ago, right? It was two weeks ago. So estrogen priming does not work. It was two or three weeks ago. We, re we reviewed that on the show. So don't bother with estrogen priming. Estrogen and progesterone priming together um, will likely actually suppress you because um, that's basically taking birth control and that doesn't look like it's a good thing to do. So we try to avoid it unless you're an egg donor or something like that or have very strong ovaries, PCOS, that kind of thing. Um, what kind of medication can be used with men for morphology issues when supplements and lifestyle changes haven't made a difference? How long does he oh. need to be on this for it to be effective? So for morphology, number one is removing the stuff that damages it. So environmental toxins, plastics, chemical exposures, things like that, those are critical. The number two thing would be get rid of all smoking, all drinking, all drug use. Number three would be take fertility dedicated vitamins. Um, they do tend to be helpful in some cases. Uh, frequent ejaculation, cold therapy, all of those will help to some extent. How long does it take? For morphology, you're looking minimum about 75 days, usually more. Um, the only other thing that can be done is to extract sperm from either the epididymis or the testis, because sometimes you get better quality sperm from an extraction than you do from uh, the ejaculated sample. That's about it. Um. My dog is prepping for a transfer cycle, cycle day three. I think you wrote yeah, that one. I feel, yeah, I did. And yeah. Um, you mentioned on the 40 and infertile podcast or a study that used letrozole and Michael for a protocol for Dior. Can you mention the study again so I can locate it? What is it? Letrozole and? Microflare protocol for DOR. Well, we reviewed that on the show a couple months back. Um, maybe it was about six weeks back. I'd have to look up the study, but there are studies that now demonstrate that letrozole with um, uh, older women and letrozole in young women with very strong ovaries can actually improve your outcomes. Um, I'll see if I can find it for you while we're doing this, but um, this is an on the fly kind of thing. Let's see, letrozole. Let's resolve on FET. Oh, God, this is going to be tough. Uh, ask me in the next yeah. one while is I Is it early this. trigger beneficial for older women? If so, how early and why? Yeah, no one knows that for sure, guys. Um, there is a theory that it might be beneficial um, in older women to trigger when they're 16, um, 15 millimeters, 16 millimeters. Uh, I never jumped into that because it doesn't actually make biological sense to me that those women's eggs are ready earlier, um, but it is possible. Um, okay, so the study you want uh, is called co-treatment with letrozole during ovarian stimulation for IVF slash ICSI, a systematic review and meta-analysis and it's in Reproductive Biomedicine Online. Um, I don't have the publication date, but it was accepted the 3rd of December, 2021. Um, so it should be 
up there in reproductive biomedicine online. The main author is Natalie with a TH, um, Soderham with an N, so S O with the Finnish symbol through it, D E R H A M N, Bulo, B U with the umlau and then L O W. Uh, so you can check that out. There you go. I found it for you. Umlau. Umlau. Okay, there you go. That's the investment. <laughs> That's what investment today. Um, not a question, but just having my referral sent to you put my mind at ease. I got my VFP. Oh, that's awesome. So this patient got pregnant just by getting referred to us and having her mind set at ease. You know what? Truth is that actually happens a lot. Um, a lot of patients just are able to allow their bodies to work a bit more naturally when they have the confidence to feel that something is going to come. And I don't know what it is about that biological switch, but it just clicks and then they get pregnant. So we have loads of patients that get referrals to us and then are pregnant before they ever come to see us. That's how good we are. <laughs> the body knows. You're going to see like, the body knows. I know. It's pretty cool. Yeah, he's going to mess with us. We yeah, better be ready. ready. <laughs> yeah, it's, you don't want to be embarrassed. it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I actually love those stories. So congratulations to you. And um, uh, thank you for pointing that out. That's great. That's totally awesome. You know what? We got to post that on Instagram. Okay, I will. That's I'll a good boat. Yeah, out. make sure you make chop sure. that out and post that. Yeah, take a, take a screenshot of that yeah. one. Fire away. Is it worth it to transfer embryo day three, 40 years old, DX for egg quality? Yeah, that's a great question. And people, I, I actually had this discussion with um, someone on Instagram the other day, a, a patient on Instagram who said, you know, why should I wait till day five? My embryos never make it till day five. Maybe I should try day three. So this is an ongoing debate. And the, the pro of doing a day three is you've still got a live embryo. Maybe it still looks really good on day three. You, in theory, have a better incubator inside you than we do in the lab because you're a human incubator and we're a, you know, mechanical incubator. Um, and so, you know, all the proteins and enzymes and chemicals and steroids and everything are there and ready to go. We're just kind of doing the fly by the seat of our pants as close to scientifically accurate version as we can. Um, so those are the pros for doing the day three. On the con side, number one, you don't know if your embryo is genetically normal. And at your age group, 75% or more of your embryos will not be genetically normal. So if it doesn't work, you don't know why it didn't work, which is a big issue. Number two, if it's not going to make it to day five, it's probably not going to make it. So while the theory that it would be better in you makes some sense, there's actually no proof that that's the case. And there's no way to do that study because you can't use and not use the same embryo at the same time. So that doesn't make a huge amount of sense. But at the same time, you know, the theory really is that an embryo that's not strong enough to grow till day five in the lab, well, it probably wouldn't succeed inside you either. And then the final part of it is if you're doing a day three embryo transfer and you're doing it fresh, um, depending on how high your estrogen levels are, there can be all sorts of endometrial asynchrony at that point. If you're doing a day five embryo, um, hopefully you're not doing it fresh. You're probably doing it frozen. Um, and those frozen transfers are going to be a little bit more beneficial because we can coordinate things better for you. If you only have one or two eggs um, and that's all you produce, is it reasonable to go ahead and do a fresh day three transfer? I actually think it is under those circumstances. But if you've made many eggs, I would grow them out. I would do the PGT. I would see what it shows. How soon after a C-section can I do an FET? Is there any optimal time I should wait? Um, so for your baby, you want to breastfeed for six months minimum. Um, and actually new recommendations are saying much longer. Um, so I would say a minimum of six months for the baby. Um, if you want to make it safest and you're hoping to have a vaginal delivery, you want to delay the embryo transfer till 15 months from the birth of your last child. Um, if you are not interested in having a vaginal birth after the cesarean section, 
you're going to go back for another C-section, then any time after that six months is fine. I wouldn't do it less than six because you really do want to breastfeed. It has a lot of benefits for your baby. And I am a strong proponent of mom's breastfeeding. I'm not saying everybody has to breastfeed. I don't want a whole bunch of people jumping out saying you're a, a bottle feeding hater. I'm not. Um, there are circumstances where it's necessary. But is it beneficial for both mom and baby to breastfeed? It is always more beneficial to breastfeed than bottle feed. So if you can do it, you should. How long does it take to get sperm DNA fragmentation test results back? A um, couple of days usually, depending on when we've batched it to do it. But um, usually within a few days, we have the results. Is it possible to do IUI with frozen thawing sperm? My husband is away working. Absolutely. I mean, every time someone does donor sperm, that's what they're doing. So, yeah, that's very common. You can do IVF. You can do IUI. There's no problems with frozen sperm. Frozen sperm works way better than frozen eggs. So frozen sperm is fine. We use it all the time with great results. What information can you get from an HSG test and who should get one? As a first line test to diagnose problems with the shape of your uterus or whether or not your tubes are open, the HSG should be eliminated from all fertility um, testing. It is not a first line test anymore. There is absolutely zero justification for doing an HSG. Everyone should be getting a saline infusion sauna histogram. Way more information from a saline infusion sauna histogram, way less discomfort, no x-ray exposure, roughly the same amount of time, no need to go to a hospital where there are loads of people with COVID. Um, so it's way safer to have an SIS and you get more information. You get the inside of the uterus and the outside of the uterus. So you can distinguish septate from bicornuate. You can look at the ovaries, you can count the number of eggs, and you can see the tubes quite clearly if the doc knows what they're doing. So um, that's all completely reasonable. There's no reason why you can't do that. With regards to indications for a hysterosalpingogram, if your saline infusion sauna histogram can't distinguish if the tubes are open, which does happen for us, then you need a hysterosalpingogram or a repeat SIS first, or laparoscopy, but hysterosalpingogram is a great test at that point because you can actually see it. I did one this morning at 7.15. One tube was open, the other tube was closed. So when we did the SIS, we couldn't see either of them open. Dr. DNT, do you recommend triggering with Lupron or dual trigger if at any risk of OHSS? Um, so you can avoid OHSS with a dual trigger. Dual triggers do not necessarily cause OHSS. It depends on how much HCG you use. So we titrate our HCG to the estrogen level of the patient and the number of eggs. Um, so for example, in our egg donor population, we're using a very, very, very small amount of HCG. Um, whereas in someone that only has three or four eggs, we might use 3000 of HCG. Um, I have a patient in New York who I like very much. Um, she's probably watching, so hi V if you're watching, um, who had a long discussion with me about the fact that the center she was working with um, in the New York area, a very well-known center, um, told her she was high risk for hyperstimulation, but she only had three mature follicles. Um, and so, you know, in a situation like that, you're not gonna hyperstim, like that's literally impossible. So you can use a higher dose of HCG, you can use the Lupron trigger and you can use them together. If you jump on our YouTube channel, one of our faster growing videos right now um, is single, it's called dual or single trigger or single or dual trigger, dual or single trigger. Um, and it's got like a yellow banner. So check out that video because we actually um, reviewed an article that talked about which one was better. And it's um, absolutely crystal clear which one is better because they actually compared HCG only, Lupron only, and both of them together. And it's very clear which one is the best of the three. So check that out and see because it's crystal clear. Dual trigger is always better. And there are so many studies that support that now. Dr. V and T, can you please explain why not? use a biopsy for treatment of chronic. 
because biopsies require a pathologist to look at the tissue and determine if you have endometritis, acute or chronic, based on diagnostic criteria. The problem with that is, and there are studies on this, if I take 10 pathologists and I show them the exact same picture and I block them from the ability to look at one another's answer so they can't cheat, you're going to get roughly about a 60% agreement, which is basically no better than chance. So it's a useless test because there's no agreement on what constitutes endometritis. Not only is there no agreement pathologically on what constitutes endometritis, there isn't even a, an agreed upon definition of what constitutes chronic endometritis. So it's a useless test because there is no definition for it. What your pathologist is going to call it doesn't necessarily even mean anything. So you need biochemical testing, which is Emma and Alice or Fertilisys or someone that can do PCR on the DNA of the bacteria, because that's actually going to tell you what's there. The question continues. Oh, okay. And when I was I supposed to wait? Did I like rudely? No, no, no. no. It, it, I didn't still, rudely cut you off. Questions, but she, All right. Just I just wanted to make sure I wasn't. You were a gentleman. Okay, there. perfect. Thank Absolutely. you. And when I treat the endometritis, does my husband yes. have to treat it too? Yes. Can he reinfect me? Yes. Yeah, we always treat the partners. Your partner needs to be treated because if he's carrying the bacteria that's giving you the infection to begin with, you're just going to bounce it back and forth between one another until, you know, you're both treated. So we generally will treat the women for a month and the guys for about two weeks because it's easier to treat the guys than it is the women. I'm 43. Okay. And 12 weeks pregnant with an untested embryo. Okay. Should I have an am amnesin? No, 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 no. Just get your NIPT test, non-invasive prenatal test. Heart, well, if you're in Ontario, uh, Harmony or um, Panorama uh, are the ones that are here. If you're in the U.S., um, just send it to Invitae. It's 100 bucks. Even if you're in Canada, um, it's cheaper to, um, you know, just get Invitae. Uh, although if you're 43 in Ontario, it's covered. Um, but if you're in a place where it's not covered, Invitae will do an NIPT test for literally $99 US. So just call them up, start, you know, they'll ship it to you, you get your blood drawn, you send it, you know if your baby's normal or not. Do not do an amnio. At 43, you've got a very precious pregnancy and amnio has a 0.5% risk of miscarriage. So that's not something you want to do. Is DHEA supplementation effective? If so, why and for who? Age group? Uh, diminished ovarian reserve, it is beneficial. Um, women with previous poor outcomes, it is beneficial. Uh, there's some controversy about whether or not it works, but the latest meta-analysis does demonstrate a benefit. So I'm prone to saying at this point in time that it is beneficial. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I can categorically say there's one amazing randomized controlled trial that demonstrated that, but there's enough data that when you pile it together, you can say, yeah, it looks like overall it's beneficial. And it is pretty substantial. The newest meta-analysis actually showed an increase in live birth. So that's substantial because that's not something they had shown before. How can I best prepare for an upcoming FET? Low stress, exercise, healthy diet, um, keep your weight down, no smoking, no drinking, no drug use, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, melatonin, um, baby aspirin, uh, use electrozole protocol, take antibiotics, take probiotics right after your antibiotics, um, take progesterone vaginally and progesterone in oil, get your progesterone levels checked. I think that was everything, right? I did. Watch our YouTube channel. Oh, watch our YouTube channel. Yes, there you go. Very watch relaxing. our You know what? We need to prepare for FET little short video. Oh, like we do. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Top five, you know, preps yeah. for FET. Make a mental note of that one and we'll do that next time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are the, the ones you want to do. Or top 10, I guess, for that one. There's a lot. Yeah. Uh, those are the things you want to do. That will be on a YouTube video for you. 
How many cycles should I wait after miscarriage? HCG is negative at all seven weeks after DMC. Zero. You do not need to wait. That was shown about three or four years ago in a study from obstetrics and gynecology, which is called the Green Journal because it's green. Um, so yeah, just uh, jump on the next cycle. You don't need to wait. Or I guess jump on your partner the next cycle, whatever. <laughs> right yeah. Uh, can stim meds, Menopure 75 UI, Puragon 350 UI, stop an already started period? Day one stim, one medium flow, morning, 3 p.m. stop, came back in the early morning hours, stopped again 1 p.m., three hours after injection. Um, no, it shouldn't. Not that quickly, especially if it's one of your first shots. If you are already several days into it and your estrogen level is rising high enough, it'll stabilize the lining. So I guess in that situation it could, but no, not if it was your first set of shots. There's no way it would be that fast. Ready? I'm always ready. Hi, T. And Dr. V. <laughs> You're so pretty. <laughs> These are my favorite questions. All right, fire away. Right. They do on. love you, man. You've been my my yeah. my BFF for three years. Um, How long have we been doing this? Is it more than three years now? It's going it's three and something, I think. It's three and something, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember what month we did our first show? I remember having coffee with you at Second Cup, which doesn't exist anymore. People we started our shows. I remember that. Yeah. Was that like a fall? I think we no, started fall. in the winter yeah, or something. Yeah, it was right, right? in the winter. I think so, yeah. Anyways, well, it's been a while. So that must be, we're coming up to four years yeah, now. Yeah, I think so. Jeez. Okay, fire away. I'm ready. Hi, Team Dr. V. Okay. Can you share your FEV protocol for patients with very low AMH? 41 years old, no endo. We have only a few embryos, four AB, two BB, and two early blasts. Which one of these would you transfer first? So I would use your 4AB because that's by far your best embryo. So that part's easy. Our transfer protocol is as follows. Cycle day 21, you do a shot of Lupron. Uh, day three of your cycle, you start letrozole for five days. So day three, four, five, six, seven. Um, make sure you're monitored on day three to make sure everything's okay. Hormones, all that stuff. Get monitored again, maybe day eight, nine, 10, somewhere in there. Make sure you're not growing any follicles. If you are, you need to be careful because your follicles may get big enough that they release on their own. If you're not, um, then that's fine. Just wait. See if your estrogen level is going high enough to, uh, or your lining is thickening enough to get ready for progesterone. If it's not, wait a little while longer and see if it does. If it doesn't, you need to add a smidgen of estrogen, very small amounts. Like we use one milligram of estrace a day. If you are thickening, you don't need any estrogen, so avoid it. Once your lining gets to at least seven, but preferably eight millimeters, start vaginal and injectable progesterone. Get your levels checked three days after you've started. Make sure they're between 40 and 100 nanomoles per liter. Um, aim for your embryo transfer on after five days of completed progesterone, so morning of the sixth day um, or seven day if you have a um, six day embryo. In between all of that, vitamin D, iron, omega-3 fatty acids, melatonin, baby aspirin. Take antibiotics at the same time you're taking the letrozole. Take probiotics right after your, um, we use z -Pack, so it's five days. So then use probiotics right after that. That's pretty much our whole protocol in a nutshell. You're the only guy that tells the secrets. Yeah, I know. We do share our secrets. I got in trouble for that, actually, from our lab director who said, don't share your secrets. So, you know what? I want to help the most number of people. For me, if we can help you and you get pregnant, great. Like, I'm not in it to make more money. I'm in it to help people make families. So um, if it works for you guys by watching our YouTube, hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. No, hi, Dr. V or T. Oh, just straight just into straight the question? Into it, yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's blunt, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how long into a pregnancy can you continue using progesterone? Is it safe to use it into the second and third trimester, or does this typically stop after the first trimester? Um, I'd say most places stop after the first trimester. We actually continue our IVF patients till 36 weeks because you are at a higher risk of preterm labor. 
And it's very clear that progesterone reduces preterm labor. So we continue till 36. There's no harm from long-term progesterone use. It's fine. We had a 10 cell fresh embryo day three failed. I'm 31 years old mm -hmm. and we did ICSI. We have male factors. What do you suggest? We did natural IVF, scared of IVF medication causing cancer. What are the next steps? Uh, okay, so I'm sorry you failed. Um, there is absolutely zero evidence that IVF medications cause cancer. That's something we have reviewed on the show. I should probably make a video about that one too. So um, we've reviewed that on the show several times. Um, there are huge studies looking at this. It is very clear that IVF medications do not cause cancer. So I would stop worrying and not do natural cycle IVF and just make the number of embryos that you need. You should grow them out to day five. If you want a natural cycle IVF cycle, and that's the only thing you want to do, um, I mean, that's a try and try and try until it works situation. Little tweaks might help, but they're not going to make a huge difference for you. So I would just continue doing it. I wouldn't do day three, though. Um, you could, but we would probably still tell you to grow it out to day five to make sure you're putting in a decent embryo. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. My period was triggered by Provera. Why okay. the first day of bleeding was orange instead of red? I also used fibroid removal surgery two months ago. I have no idea why you would have orange instead of red. I can't answer that. Um, but uh, Provera is fine to start your period. I, I honestly have no clue why you would get orange instead of red. I can't even think of a biological reason why that would happen. Test embryos, PGS is necessary or optional for a lady of 40 years old, poor air quality, seven embryos still developing, day two, waiting for blasting. Um, I would definitely say testing. So at 40, especially if you have, um, you know, weaker ovaries, the percentage chance that your embryos are abnormal is very, very high. Um, so you're looking over 80% of your embryos being genetically not normal. Some people would argue much higher than that. So out of the seven that you have, even if all seven of them made it to blastocyst, you may get one or two that are normal. You want to know which one those one or two are so that you're transferring the correct embryo. Hello, Dr. TV. Dr. TV. <laughs> We got them all. <laughs> there you go. All right. I like it. Uh, you I'm like it, yeah. Of course I'm you do. <laughs> Not with Dr. VT. Just remember that. TV. So we have a 41 years old. Yeah. BMI 19. Okay. No endo, no PCOS, okay. no polyps, no fibroids, TSH 1.9. Okay. No male factor, no drinking, no drugs, no smoking, use DE. Mining was 10.3 millimeters at the time of transfer. PGT tested 4AB embryo. And it didn't work? Um, failed DE cycle. Any recommendations or suggestions? Any additional tests to run? Possible reasons why it failed? Failed DE cycle? Like you failed the whole donor egg cycle? Okay, so if they were frozen eggs, that could be a reason. If your partner has poor quality sperm or high DNA fragmentation, that could be a problem. Aside from that, um, it's got to be something immunological or wrong with your uterus, like an infection, immune problem, those kinds of things. So um, in those circumstances, those are great cases where you should reach out to me, do a consult, and I'll figure it out. I actually kind of like those cases. So um just contact info at drvictory.com, drvictory.com. Ask for a consult um, and we'll chat with you and figure out what you need to do. I, I can tell you that um, we almost never have people that fail donor egg cycles. It is very, very, very rare for us. It does happen, but it's extremely rare. Um, like I can count on one hand the total number of times. So uh, and we are huge with donor egg cycles. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely, I would reach out to us and we will help you figure it out. I've done five IUIs at the age of 35 as a single mother by chose with frozen donor sperm. And okay. so far, I've had no luck. Oh. My baseline testing showed no issues. My AMH is 1.66. 
trying to tie it. Um, if it's 1.66 picomoles per liter, um, that's arguable because your chances are extremely low because your ovaries are weak. You will get a better success rate with IVF, but it's hard to debate whether or not that's valuable for you because it's not going to be that much higher than your IUI success. If it's 1.66 nanograms per milliliter, yes, you should move to IVF. Um, you could do one more IUI. There's this great Chinese study we reviewed. I forget what the title of that video is, but it's like how many is too many or something like that. So um, you can do up to six cycles of IUI if you're less than 38 years of age and still see a slight increase in success. Um, but for women older than 38, it was three. Um, so in your case, you could do one more. And then after that, I would definitely do IVF. But even after five, it's probably reasonable to say that an extra 3% incremental increase is not worth it. And I want to jump into IVF now. Hi, Dr. VNT. Are you aware of any downsides to taking vaginal Viagra or steroids during the FET cycle? None. There's some suggestion that steroids have an increased risk of cleft lip, cleft palate. We use it in all our patients. We've never seen cleft lip, cleft palate frequently, any more than the baseline rate. So um, I don't think that that's a concern, but um, that's the only thing that's ever been expressed. Nothing with Viagra. Yeah. Hello, T and Dr. V. There you go. There you go. Uh, I think Levadolol. Well, probably. you certainly are. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know yeah. if we could say everybody, yeah. but you're done. Uh, I like it. this question. Stand up here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I take Levadolol for high blood BP. pressure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what other blood pressure medications can be used to keep BP in check, thereby avoiding PIH? Um, well, aspirin is what's going to avoid PIH, not blood pressure medications. Blood pressure medications control your blood pressure, but aspirin can actually be preventative for PIH. Um, the newest issue of the Green Journal actually um, has guidelines about pregnancy at age 35 years or older. And one of the things they recommend is all women over the age of 40 should be taking aspirin. Um, we already knew that and we're doing it for decades now, but um, I, I've been doing that forever. So yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Um, in terms of what other medications other than labetalol, labetalol um, is your first uh, line therapy. Um, Adelat uh, XL would be your second line therapy. Methyl dopa would be your third line therapy, although I never use it because I think it's garbage. Um, and that's pretty much it. If you transfer an untested embryo, what are the chances of implantation or miscarriage if it's abnormal? How far along can you get? Can you get before knowing it's abnormal? Also, hi, Doctor Dean. <laughs> hi. Uh, so probably about eighty percent of them um, or more will not implant. If they do implant, eighty percent, um, sixty to eighty percent will miscarry. If they still hang around, um, it's available for diagnosis after nine weeks using NIPT testing. So um, that would be the earliest you could find out. Welcome back, Dr. V. Hi, T. Thank you. Uh, Somebody that aware. recognized that. I know, hey, they're that I wasn't there. Yeah. I got a bit of a tan. Do I have a bit of a tan? Do you notice that? Yeah, I, I got a little color. Last yeah. time you came back, you had a really bigger tan. Oh, did I really? Oh, you were like From so Italy, fine. you mean? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, there you go. I didn't wear suntan lotion there. So there it is. And it was hot. <laughs> uh, I asked this on DM, sorry. I want to better understand. Why is RE putting me on birth control for FET protocol? Period is punctual every 25 to 26 days. Good or bad, to be honest. Um, so, uh, okay. So they're putting you on it. I don't know why, but my um, hypothesis would be that it's to make their lives easier. So I think I answered your question on the DM um, or somebody else asked the same question recently because I did answer them. So it's because they're using it to schedule themselves, right? So if I don't want to work on a certain weekend um, and I want to avoid an FET being ready, then I can put you on the birth control pill so that I time things so it happens when I want you to have your period. Um, is it beneficial or detrimental? 
it's definitely detrimental to use birth control for women with weak ovaries who are doing stim. For FET, no one has shown that it's beneficial or detrimental. So I don't know whether it's good or bad. There is data that shows that when you're doing a fresh embryo transfer and you're taking birth control prior to your ovarian stimulation, there is a higher risk of miscarriage if you're on birth control for too short a period of time. Um, so for two weeks would be considered short. It needed to be a minimum of four to six in order to avoid that miscarriage risk. Um, but that's a different scenario from just an FET. I don't think it's likely to cause a problem, but we don't use birth control anymore in our FET protocols unless we have to. Um, so that's us. Hello, Dr. Green. Do you see patients from the United States? I'm your neighbor in Michigan. Every day. <laughs> so uh, we have a huge American following. Um, I've got patients coming from Colorado, California, Texas, New York, Michigan, Ohio, um, Indiana. I've lost track of all the states people are coming to us from. The Virgin Islands, which I know are not the U.S., but um, we got all sorts of people coming from all sorts of places. So, yeah, head on out. Um, just give us a call. We do it all over Zoom. Or if you're in Michigan, feel free to come on over. I was just in Michigan for a week at my cottage. So absolutely, we would be happy to help you out. Can you conceive with an ovarian cyst, TPC, and found out I have one? Um, it depends on what kind of ovarian cyst. So some ovarian cysts will interfere, like an endometrioma. Um, a cyst that is creating hormones will interfere. So that can be a problem. Um, but if it's just a functional cyst and it's not hormonally active, um, yeah, of course you can get pregnant. If it's a paratubal cyst, yes, of course you can get pregnant. Um, if you have a dermoid, you can get pregnant, but you may not want to because dermoids can grow during pregnancy. And the last thing you want is surgery while you're pregnant. So it depends on what kind of cyst it is. Talking about secret sauce, I can't believe you shared the whole protocol with us. <laughs> This is gold, and you are an angel, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, I think all the people watching the show are the angels. I'm just the guy that kind of uh, feeds the angels. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so you guys are the warriors. We're just here to help you out. That's all. We're the food supply. We're the food supply. We're the food supply. Hi, Dr. V. Do you agree with the line of thought that too high estrogen during egg retrieval can potentially compromise the quality of egg? Um, no. So we use egg donors all the time. Their estrogen levels are crazy high and we still get great embryos. So I don't think estrogen level compromises your egg quality. I think that it'll definitely interfere with implantation if you try and go for a fresh transfer, but I don't really believe it has a huge impact on egg quality because we don't see it. And we have donors with estrogens that are literally crazy high. So I don't think that that's a problem. We still get loads of beautiful embryos. How common is a blighted ovum or mis miscarriage? Is it normal to only have cramping and a sore chest at six weeks? Um, how common is a miscarriage or blighted ovum? Um, I don't have stats specifically on blighted ovum, but one out of every six pregnancies will result in a miscarriage. Um, that's a very common statistic. Um, is it common to just have a sore chest and cramps? Yeah, sure, that's very common. Just if you have cramps, make sure you don't have an ectopic. So it's not really normal to have cramping that much. Go get checked out. Hi, y'all. Does letrozole mask your estrogen levels or does it actually suppress estrogen levels? Uh, no, it actually suppresses estrogen levels. It doesn't mask it, it suppresses it. But that's a good thing in most circumstances. Okay. It's one minute to nine. You want this to be the one? Uh, up to you. Do we have a couple more or a bunch more? Is it another big show? You got, you got more. <laughs> Tarek's furiously rubbing his eyes behind the camera as he's telling me that. So, uh, That's just a, a sinus interaction. It's a sinus I interaction. Love these angels, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can do a couple more. All right. Hi, Dr. B. The reason I asked. Because if I had to find the, the, the question, question. Tarek's terminal question, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ask a couple. Okay. Hi, Dr. BNT. Our DNA fragmentation me back to 35%. Is there anything we could do to decrease it? Thank you guys for all the kindness and your time. Uh, yeah, DNA fragmentation is kind of easy. No smoking, no drinking, no drug use. And I mean none, zero. That's number one. Number two, take fertility vitamins. Number three, ejaculate every day or every other day. Uh, number four, if weight is an issue, you got to get your weight down because that has a huge impact on DNA fragmentation. Avoid any chemicals, exposures, that kind of thing. Um, keep your underwear loose, keep your testicles cold. And then finally ejaculate three hours after the first ejaculation, because it's an 80% decrease in your DNA fragmentation with the second sample. Is it normal to go from a heavy menstrual cycle to a very light side cycle after one year of using letrozole? Does this affect ovulation at all? Concerned lining is thin from letrozole. Thanks. Um, letrozole would not have any long lasting impact on your lining. Um, now, if you were taking letrozole for PCOS and you used to have really heavy periods, that's because you were getting estrogen excess and letrozole will definitely control that. But that's a good thing, not a bad thing. But it's not going to permanently thin out your lining. There's no evidence to suggest that. I had a clinical pregnancy loss after 10 weeks. Oh, I'm sorry. I was given... My soul is a prostal. He's a prostal vaginally to induce miscarriage, and it was the worst pain I went through. Oh, it's been 15 and three failed IUIs and many natural cycles, and nothing has worked. I wonder if my soul predatrol my soul prostal. Hmm. They spelt it wrong, yeah. yeah. Has anything to do with it not being able to get pregnant again? That was 15 months from my previous. Oh, um, it shouldn't, but you probably need a evaluation of your uterus. And if it's been 15 months, you should be seeing a fertility specialist. So I'm sorry you're going through all of that. Um, definitely connect with one of us and we would be happy to help you and, and guide you through what you need. Um, but you need testing for sure. 15 months is a long time to be unsuccessful. And there are people that have retained tissue. They can have calcifications in the uterus following a miscarriage. Calcifications can prevent pregnancy. So there's all sorts of different things that need to be looked at. Uh, what do you think the best supplement for sperm health is? I try and shy away from speaking about any specific product. Um, I can tell you the ones we um, use here and I, I'm not saying they're better than any other product. I'm just saying they're the ones that are carried by our pharmacy. So we use a Canadian product from a company called YAD, Y-A-D, and they make a line called ProFertile. And ProFertile has, um, or sorry, they make a line called Fertile Pro. And there's Fertile Pro Men, Fertile Pro MTL, and Fertile Pro Ubic. So you kind of need to take all three of those. Um, we use another line from an Austrian company. I forget what they're called, um, but their brand is Pro Fertile. So instead of Fertile Pro, it's Pro Fertile. Um, that actually has Health Canada approval um, for its intended purpose, which is to improve sperm, because they actually did the studies and showed that it improves sperm. So uh, it is a great product. We have seen some really good results. We see good results with both. Uh, again, I'm not partial to any particular brand. Um, I don't do that for fertility drugs. I don't do that for vitamins. We just use whatever is the best. Um, fertility drugs, I definitely have my favorites, but we don't broadcast that on uh, YouTube because I don't want to promote a single product over any other. It's not about product promotion. It's about helping people. Hi, Dr. v &T. My dog feels we will be lucky to get my lining to six millimeters. Would you risk a transfer of this line? Um, depends on how many embryos you have and what you've tried. There are a lot of things that can be tried to thicken your lining. A lining less than seven millimeters is associated with a decrease in success. So if they're feeling you'll be lucky to get to six, I would want to double check everything before um, you go ahead. Do you feel lucky? Do you feel lucky? Yeah, that's the wrong thing to say to a fertility specialist or to a fertility patient. Okay, we're we're like way past. 905. One more. Tari's terminal question. Sure. Fire away. I got to make sure the home is clean before wifey gets there. 
She's coming back, man. Welcome. Back yeah, I better call the kids. Kids, if you're watching, clean the house before mom gets home. Hi, yeah. doctor. Okay. How many cycles of egg retrieval without success would you recommend to your patients to stop? Oh, that's a great question. You know what? I was thinking today, I love your question. I was thinking today we need a YouTube video on how many cycles. So um, it's age and outcome and center dependent. So um, if you're 40, it might be reasonable to try several times, even five or six. If you're 30, it might only be reasonable to try twice. If you're making three eggs at a time, you may need multiple tries. If you're making 30 eggs at a time, one should be enough. So it's very highly dependent on you and your age and your outcomes in terms of the number of eggs and embryos and things like that. Um, your center is also critical. So if you're at a center where they're practicing fly by the seat of their pants medicine, which seems to be a lot of places, um, then that's a problem because, you know, we hear all the time that in Australia, it's normal to do 12 to 16 cycles of IVF. I mean, I would literally willingly hand in my license if it took me 16 tries of IVF to get someone pregnant. That's insane. Um, but if you're at a place where they are doing their very, very best, and they're trying everything possible, and you've tried several times already, that's probably time to consider doing something different. I'm not saying you have to stop, but maybe you need to consider donor sperm. Maybe you need to consider half-half. Maybe you need to consider donor eggs. Maybe you need a surrogate. Maybe you need surgery. I, I don't know, but whatever the specific circumstances are, your physician needs to offer you rational choices. Um, you know, many physicians just say, oh, just try again. Oh, just try again. Oh, just try again. Yeah, that's literally what Freud defined as the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. It's not going to do something different for you. If you're doing the same thing again and again and again, you're going to get the same outcome again and again and again. So that's not rational in, in my thought process. Um, so, you know, it's very age dependent for sure because older women will need more tries just because of the genetics. It's very ovarian reserve dependent because if you're making, even if you're older and you're making 20 eggs, you need way less tries than the same age woman who's making three eggs. Um, and same thing when you're younger. And then it's very center dependent. So if your center can take 10 eggs and turn them into eight great embryos, you're not gonna need as many tries as the center that takes 10 eggs and turns them into two embryos or three embryos, right? So um, obviously you're getting a lot more out of the one that's getting you eight embryos than you are from the one that's getting you two or three. So you gotta factor all of that into it before you decide how many tries is enough for you. And I really firmly believe that it's patient to patient specific, but I do believe, and this is why I love your question, that you and your fertility specialist need to draw a line in the sand. Fertility can be very addictive. And I've had patients that just wanted to keep trying again and one more try and one more try. And, and I actually tell people, no, like it's not going to work. I'm not going to keep doing this for you because I'm not taking your money to give you nothing. That doesn't make sense. So you and your fertility specialist, if they care about you, they will tell you ahead of time, hey, you know, your whatever number of years of age that you are, in your case, it would be reasonable to try this X number of times, if we hit that point and we're not successful, we really need to talk about a different or alternative option. And then we can go from there. Okay. Um, and that's my daughter calling me. So I think that's a warning sign that we need to call it quits. Uh, all right, guys, thank you very much for watching Fertility Factor Fiction. It was a question and answer session only. I hope I got to most people's questions tonight. If not, DM us um, and we will get back to you. Thank you again to my illustrious friend, Tarek from Ibrahim Strategies Group. We love you, buddy. And uh, we will see you next week on Fertility Factor Fiction. Have a great night.